Please stand, if you would, as we join together in our generation's worship.
join with us as we raise a hallelujah. Here we go. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief.
One more time. Here we go. It's good to be in God's house today. Um, Have you noticed that things are different today? There's a lot of folks up here. It's our generation's worship, and we're so glad to have all of our worship ministry uh, groups from our most senior group, the Singing Hearts over here. Thank you guys so much for being here. And we've got the normal folks, but we appreciate them, the orchestra and the choir. We love them as well. We have our student choir. So good to have them with us, right? And then let's be honest, the cute ones. We're good to, it's good to have the children's choir with us, kids' choir. We believe that this is a little glimpse of what it'll be like in heaven. It isn't about age, it isn't about style, it's about God and God alone. And us as a fellowship of believers coming together, lifting praises to him and to him alone who is worthy, amen? But today is also a day that's a little bit heavy. Uh, Today is the anniversary of uh, September 11th, 2001, and I think we'd be amiss if we don't just take a second, about 30 seconds in our service today to remember those who fell in that awful attack and remember those who were left behind, friends, family, and those um, that carry the burden of loss along with our entire country. Uh, But we'd just like to take a moment and uh, just remember them, pray for them, And then we'll continue worshiping in just a moment. Let's have a moment of silence. Thank you so much for that. Now, if you're a guest, we're so glad that you're here today. If you take the time and you can... uh, text new to the number that's on the screen or fill out the little card in the pocket right in front of you. We'd appreciate that. We'd love to connect with you and your family. Now take just a moment and greet those around you and we'll continue worshiping.
Here we go, by our love. By our love. Declare it out. Thank you, choir, youth choir, senior adult choir, and children's choir. Everybody's up here this morning. You may be seated. What a beautiful time of worship it has been. Uh, yesterday, we had our men's prayer breakfast, and Rick Eubanks, uh, co-founder of See You at the Pole, uh, shared with our men. We had over 100 men there yesterday morning, and he shared with us the importance of ministering to the next generation coming up because we are losing them in the church. And so I just want to let you know that here at Spring Baptist Church, we are committed to ministering to all generations. And it's so beautiful to see everybody up here on stage this morning. Let's give them another uh, round of applause. Doing a great job leading us in worship this morning. All of these things are possible. All of the programs that we have for children and young adults and senior adults and median adults. All are possible because of your faithful giving to the Lord. And here at Spring Baptist Church, we make it really easy to give. You can text the word GIVE to the number on the screen. You can bring your offering to the boxes in the foyer, or you can go on the, our website or our church app. And it's a very easy to give. But we want you to be praying about what God would have you give 
toward his work here at Spring Baptist Church and through Spring Baptist Church as we, as we minister to these families, as we minister to our community, and as we take the gospel all around the world. And so let's pray for these offerings, and then we'll continue in worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being generous with us. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would show us during this time of the service what you would have us give back to you for your work here at Spring Baptist Church and all around the world. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would take these offerings and you would multiply them to bring yourself glory in all that we do. And, Lord, we just ask these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. on high, hallelujah, amen, let praises fill the sky.
Don't you love seeing these uh, children and teenagers and senior adults and everything in between up here this morning? Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you. Hopefully, well, she's excited. Um, hopefully, you've got these little cards with the red uh, tab on the top, voyage card. And if you didn't, you can pick them up in front of your uh, seat back in front of you or out in the Welcome Center. I'm going to ask you to bring these back next week. So be praying about it. I'm actually be praying about what God would have you commit to. And um, I think it's important that we do uh, 100% involvement if we can. Just every one of us saying, God, I will do this. And again, I'm going to tell you that sometimes people say, I don't like to commit things. I don't like to sign things. We do it all the time. So that didn't, that didn't hold water, right? We sign, we sign paperwork on credit card bills. We sign paperwork on our mortgage. We sign paperwork to buy a refrigerator or whatever. And again, the church is not going to hound you. If you sign up to, to do this, we're not going to come and knock on your door and say, uh, we, we see that you're $12 behind. We're not going to do that, okay? So don't worry. But it does help us plan for the future. So make sure that you're involved in this. We've been in a series called Voyage, Embracing Our Future. And the title of the message this morning is, It's Time to Step into the Water. Can we say that together? It's time. Now, you just said that like you only put one, one toe in there. Let's say it like we got both feet in, right? Ready? It's time to step into the water. Amen, amen. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp, giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we pray that we'll trust you that you will reveal your will to, will to us, each and every one of us. And that by faith, we will follow you wherever you lead us. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Forty years earlier to the passage that we just read a moment ago, Moses, and you know the story, had led the Israelites out of Egypt. They were in a terrible situation, terrible circumstances. They were slaves there. But God said, I'm going to provide a way of escape for you. And the Bible records for us that he led the Israelites out of the Egyptian bondage. As they journeyed, they left and they journeyed toward that promised land that God had told them about. Two million of them get to the Red Sea. And when they get to the Red Sea, they began to wonder something. It's probably the same thing you and I would wonder. How are we going to get across this? Much too wide, much too deep, currents too fast. How in the world are we going to get across the Red Sea? But the Bible records for us that God opened up the Red Sea and that all two million of them walked across on muddy land. Is that what it says? On dry land. And from there, once they got to the other side, they had roughly a two-week journey left into that land of milk and honey, the land of Canaan. So two more weeks and they would have been there. And this is where I conclude as I read this story that those two million Jews must have been Baptist. (laughs) They had seen God provide miracle after miracle. They had gone through the Red Sea on dry land. They get to the other side. And in less than two weeks, the Bible says they had grown disgruntled. They were discouraged and they were depressed. And you know what they started saying? We want to go back to Egypt. At least in Egypt, we had food to eat. At least in Egypt, we had somewhere to lay our head. They wanted to go back into slavery. Can you imagine even for a moment that after God would set you free from being a slave, that you would have any desire whatsoever to go back into slavery? Yet that's exactly what they were telling their leadership. They wanted to go back. Now, why? Because they had quit believing God. They had lost their faith in God. They had lost their trust in God. And as a result of losing all of those things, they said to themselves, let's go somewhere that's familiar to us. 
somewhere we've been before. Let's go back to Egypt where we'll be safe and protected there. And so what did God do? He turned their two-week journey into 40 years. Someone here a while back said, there are consequences to elections. Remember that? Did you know that there are consequences to disobeying God? So 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. Disobedience always creates consequences that we do not want to have in our life. Now we're at chapter 3. What's going on now? The older generation had died. They were gone. And so now God is giving this next generation an opportunity, what he had given the older generation to do. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do what your parents would not do. So God brings them to the edge of the Jordan River. And right there, they are on the edge of the Jordan River. On the other side, from in a distance, they could see the land of milk and honey. They could see to the other side that land of blessing that God had promised them. Now, their parents wouldn't believe God for it. Now the question is, would they? At that time of year, the Jordan River was dangerously flooded. Normally, the Jordan River was only a few yards wide, but now it's almost or, or maybe even a little bit more than a mile wide, and it's got rushing water, and it was humanly impossible for them to cross the Jordan River. Now, in this passage, we're going to read a couple of words depending upon the, the uh, version of the Bible that you have, but you'll see the word cross or crossing over. They crossed the river or they're crossing over the river. It's there listed multiple times. The Hebrew word is the word abar, A-B-A-R. In other words, they were going to the other side to get to a bar. <laughs> oh, shame on you for knowing about that. But <laughs> What does a bar mean? A bar is a significant crossing over. It's when you move from one area of your life to another area of your life and you'll never forget it. It's something so impactful. It changes your heart and your mind forever in a day. It's very, very different. It's not a minor thing. It's a major thing. It's not like standing on a street corner and waiting for the little man to pop up on the light across the street that says you can walk and you get to the other side that's not a major event. That's not in a bar moment. So this was a major thing. It's something that once you cross through the other side, your life changes forever. Let me give you a few examples of that. It's in a bar moment when you get married. When you cross to the other side from being single into a marriage relationship. And here's what you learn. Help me out. It's no longer my money. It is our money. It's no longer my bathroom, it is our bathroom. It's no longer my closet, it is her closet. There you go. You got that right. <laughs> that is in a bar moment. When you have your first child and you go from being uh, just a married couple into being a parent's. And you wonder, how in the world are you going to be a good parent? I still remember when Chris was born. I, I left the hospital after being there for many hours, and, and Robin had given birth to Chris. And I think I was going to run to a store and buy him a stuffed toy or something. I had to get him something. And I remember walking out of the hospital and walking to my car, and I'm seeing people walk up and down the sidewalks and drive by in their cars. And I'm thinking to myself, don't you people realize the greatest thing in the world has just happened? My son has been born. It changed me. And then when your grandkids are born, you just go totally nuts. It changes you. Like maybe when you change careers, you had one career, you go to another career. Or you move from one state to another state. Your life is forever different, is forever changed. You know, God is still about the business of challenging us. He still has that same kind of plan for us as well. In other words, God wants us to have significant crossing overs in our life. Spiritual crossovers. 
that will forever change us. It's how we exercise our faith. It's how we grow in the Lord. It's how we mature in the Lord. And afterwards, when we cross over, we're never the same. We're different. I'd started college majoring in biology to become a dentist. Why I wanted to look in people's mouths all day long, I have no idea. I'd majored in biology for three years. I wrestled that third year, I wrestled with God for an entire year. God was calling me to preach, and I kept saying, no, no, no. I'll just be a faithful lay person, but I'm not going to preach. I don't know how to preach, and I'm not going to do it, and I don't like to stand up in front of people. I'm not going to do it. And besides that, if I surrender to your will, you may make me go to some country I don't want to go to and witness to people I don't want to witness to. And I wrestled with God, and I tried to reason with God. Have you ever tried to reason with God? Tried to get him to change his mind. But finally, after a solid year of wrestling with God, I threw up that white flag of surrender and I said, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. And you know, I've never been sorry. I changed my major from biology to psychology because I figured in the church world I'd be working with a lot of nuts. And sure enough, <laughs> I believe that Spring Baptist Church is at an abar moment in history. It's time for us to dream again. It's time for us to plan again. It's time for us to be daring. It's time for us to be bold. It's time for us to ask God to expand the ministry and ministries that He has given us bigger than what we can imagine so that when it's all said and done, we can only say God gets the glory for there is no explanation other than God did this. What are the specifics? Don't know all of them yet. I mentioned a few. We need to do a better job of missions. We got young people going on mission trips every year. I want to see our adults going on mission trips every year, maybe more than one. I want to see our adults getting involved in some parachurch ministries. I think we need to do that. We already do some of those things. We need to do more. We need to broaden the the Christian influence that we have in our own community. We need to do some tangible things like remodeling, and we need to build more buildings on this property as the Lord blesses us and grows us. And by the way, God has given us 50 acres here on this property, 13 and a half acres on the other property, and I believe that God wants us to use every square inch of it for His purposes and His glory. All of it. 100% participation in this plan. From children on up to senior adults and every age in between. We want everyone to be involved in this voyage plan. I I want you to know that I understand that some of you might say, well, Pastor, I'm a little nervous about this. or, Or I'm a little bit afraid about this. Well, the question remains, will we have our Abar moment? Will we cross over? You see, we have got to see the urgent need of the day. Look again at verse 2. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Say about a half mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the Ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. God does something very interesting right here. He forces them to face their fears. Don't you love it when God does that to you? (laughs) When God says, I know you're afraid, but I want you to grow spiritually, and therefore I'm going to put your fears right in front of your face to see if you will have enough faith to follow me. And so what did God do? He had them staring at the Jordan River which was running out of its banks over a mile wide, rushing water for three days. They stared at it day after day after day. Now, why would God do that? Because they needed to understand in order to get to the other side, they had to have God do something miraculous. God wanted them to see you can't get to the other side without me. And you've got to trust me, God was saying, and if I'm leading you, you have every reason to trust me. Follow the Ark of the Covenant. Why did they follow the Ark of the Covenant? Because it represented the presence of God. 
Sometimes we as human beings just need tangible things to remind us of God's presence, don't we? I love to see church buildings that look like church buildings. I love to see a steeple pointing in the sky. I love to see a cross to remind me that God is still in our midst and he's still at work. Those tangible things, they needed the Ark of the Covenant to remind them of the presence of God. And here's what their leaders were telling them. The leaders were saying, get your eyes on the presence of God. Don't take your eyes off of it and follow him wherever he leads. Let me say something to you this morning, and I hope your testimony is the same. I am more afraid of not following God than I am of following God. Is that your testimony, church? We must follow God. What was inside that ark? You ever wondered that? Well, we know some of the things that were in it. The Ten Commandments were in it. The Ten Commandments represented the Word of God, and we know that Aaron's staff was in it, which represented the life of God. And then we know that manna was in it, which represented the bread of heaven. So help me out, church. Who is the Word, the life, and the bread? It's Jesus. The presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant, and they were following the Word and the bread and the life which that's exactly what the New Testament, how the New Testament describes our Lord and Savior, whose name is what, church? Jesus. And what was on the lid of that ark? We know what it was called. It was the mercy seat. It's the place where the priests would come in and, and, uh, and they would take the, the blood of an innocent, unblemished animal and they would dip it in there, a, 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 a stick kind of thing with leaves on it, and dip it in there and then sprinkle it on the mercy seat. It was the blood of an innocent animal and the Bible tells us that that satisfied the holiness of God. The holiness of God. Where's the ark now? I suppose that you'd have to watch one of those movies to find out. We don't know where it is. We have no idea where the Ark of the Covenant is. But I can tell you this, we don't need it. You say, why don't we need it? Because we've got Jesus and He's enough. Amen. He's all we need. Amen. So how do we make it to the other side? Exactly what the leadership was telling the Israelites today, that day, you keep your eyes on Jesus and you follow him wherever he leads you. You see, understand this, voyage, this is not about raising funds, it's about raising our level of faith. That's really what it's about. That's why we want 100% participation in this. Will you do it or will you not do it? Something else I see here, we must be passionate about the mission of Christ. Look at verse 5. Then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. He says, purify yourself before the Lord. What does that mean? That means that we've got to get our heart right with God. Now let me ask you, church, do you want to see God do some unexplainable things in our midst as a congregation? Would you say amen if you do? Then the Bible says you've got to purify yourself. You've got to get clean before God. So the question is, how can we purify ourselves? Note this. It's not about works. It's not about you obtaining some self-righteous standard. It's not that. When you purify yourself, it is a radical commitment to stay away from sin. That's what it is. It doesn't mean any of us are ever going to reach perfection in this life. I had a friend named John Henry, and uh, he told me one time he was of a different faith that he believed you could reach sinless perfection in this life. I asked him the question, have you ever known anyone who reached sinless perfection? He said, yes, I've known one lady. And I said, how do you know? And he said, she told me. <laughs> I think she might have just missed it right there, huh? 2 Corinthians says this, therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. To purify yourself means that you have a, a hatred towards sin and a love for God. That's what it means. 
And notice it says purify yourself. I can't get purified for you. And you cannot get purified for me. And you cannot purify the person sitting next to you, although you may have been trying for many, many years. You cannot do it. You know what we like to do as human beings? We like to point out the faults of others, don't we? We like to say, well, you know, if my Sunday school teacher would just shape up, I'd start attending Sunday school class again. We might even say if my boss would get things right, if my boss would do things right, I'd be a better employee. If my husband or my wife would make this change or that change, then I'd be the kind of husband or wife that they need. So we're always pointing out the faults of someone else, and we are conveniently forgetting our own. The Bible says purify yourself. Can we say that together? Purify It's a choice, but you have to choose. And then the Bible teaches us that God calls us, and then He walks with us. So I'm going to capsulate what Joshua was saying to the people. He's saying, get your eyes on the presence of God, and get your heart committed to the holiness of God, and then watch what only God can do. That's what he's saying. If you want to see God do something amazing, purify yourself. Now, undoubtedly, they had seen the River Jordan many, many other times. They had been there when it wasn't flooding. They had been there when it was just a few yards wide instead of now a mile wide when the waters weren't rushing like they were rushing now. And we look at that and we say, man, God messed up. He should have waited until the waters were calm and the Jordan River was only a few yards wide. It would have been so much easier. What in the world was God thinking? You ever question God? God led them to the perfect place at the perfect time, even though in the eyes of many of those Israelites, if not the majority of them, they were saying, this is not a good time of the year to cross over the River Jordan. Leads me to the third thing. We must walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Don't you get tired of people that talk the talk but they don't walk the walk? You know those people whose title starts with a P, and I don't mean pastor? Politicians and others, even Christians that say one thing but do another. Look at this in verse 8 and verse 13. Give this command to the priest who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. The priest will carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. God has a specific set of instructions right here. He told Joshua, get the priest to carry the the ark into the water while it is flowing fast. See, God was going to do something that could only be explained. God did this. They didn't wait, wait across in ankle deep water, which we could explain, right? They didn't wade across in ankle deep water and calm water. It was raging water. It was deep water. And it was wide. It was a mile wide. So the Bible says right here, he told the priest, get in there. And once you get in there, the water is going to stop flowing upstream. Now, what did the priest have to do? They had to believe God. They had to trust God. They had to to know that this is a very dangerous thing and God had to come through. If God didn't come through, they would surely all drown. They had to have faith. Obedience, real obedience, will always drive us to action. James chapter 2 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action which is not accompanied by action, is dead. What is faith? Hear me. This is important. I'm going to give you a test on this. Faith is not believing in spite of evidence. Faith is obeying in spite of the consequence. Do you see the difference? God, it looks like we might drown if we try this. But if God is leading us to do it, is He going to abandon us when we step out in faith? Help me out, church, yes or no? 
Every one of us here this morning can say, you know, God wants to use me. And we'd say, amen. We could say, God wants to use Spring Baptist Church. And we would all say, amen. But those are just words. Unless you put feet to your words. Now, here's the thing that's really amazing about this story. Who were those priests and the 12 men that went into the water? Who were they? Verse 14. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan, and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the Ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarathon. And the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all of the people, help me out church, crossed over. Can we say that? They crossed over near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the ark of the Lord's covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed, say that, they had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Who were these 12 people? Can we tell you who they were? They were little boys when the Israelites left Egypt. They were just children. They were just little boys when God had freed them from slavery. They were just little boys when they crossed over the Red Sea. They were just little boys. They, they were at the back of the line. Probably doing what little boys do, throwing rocks and chasing chickens. It was easy for them to cross because they just followed the pathway that those before them had made. But they were just little boys back then. Now decades had passed. And God had called them to be leaders. And they stood on the Jordan. And they got both feet wet. You see, now it was their turn. Spring Baptist Church, it's our turn. Are we going to cross to the other side? Some people say, now, Pastor, this, this isn't the best time. Our country is in a mess. Immorality is rampant. Financial security is obsolete. Stock market is insane. Maybe we should wait for calmer waters and a less wide river. If we did that, we could explain it. But because this world is in shambles, because there might be financial instability, because immorality is running rampant, those are the very reasons we must go. That's why we can't wait until things get good. Who's to say that things will ever be good again in our eyes? But when God leads us, the question is, will we jump in with both feet? Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word which we know is true. Now God, I pray that you will give us confidence and faith to follow you no matter where you lead us in life. I pray, God, that we'll never stray away from the challenge that you lay before us. And as you begin to unfold your plan, may we boldly step into the water. In this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe God is speaking to you about being safe today. The greatest river you could cross right now is just to cross that river of being a lost person into being a, sal a saved person. Let God save you this morning. Forgive you of your sins. Maybe you need to come join the church or rededicate your life. Maybe you need to pray for more faith. Whatever it is the Lord would lead you to do, we invite you to come.